My name is Vincent and my project, uh, sorry, I'm a student from California and I'm a junior this year. And together with my mentor, Jason, we worked on this project titled Sentiment Classification of Texts Using Machine Learning. And before we start anything, I'd just like to do a quick demonstration, sorry, a quick demonstration of what our project does. So you'll see here that you have uh, this emotion classifier. So let's say I type something that's generally really sad in, like, I don't like my day today. And it'll predict, and it'll say that it is a negative emotion. And just to prove to you that it's not like a fluke, I'll do it again. Let's say this time it's, I'm so happy with my grade. And it says positive emotion. So the idea of this, a project is just to, sorry, went on a slideshow. Um, the idea of this project is just to create a, um, use machine learning to determine whether this text is happy or sad. And I just want to take a quick moment to acknowledge why I'm doing this. Um, that, uh, earlier this year, there was a girl from Palo Alto, which is very close to where I live. And she unfortunately took her own life. And, you know, I was shocked by this. So I did further research into the youth mental health scene. And I noticed that like a lot of us, especially, you know, as college going students, we're having trouble with stress and mental health. So I wanted to do my part in um, the only, well, the way I best know how, which is machine learning. So what exactly is machine learning? I'm sure you've heard this a lot today already, but machine learning, uh, I'd like to define it as the use of algorithms to make predictions on data sets. So, and that's basically it. But machine learning, there's two requirements for it. If you want to predict on something, it has to be number one is you have to be able to make it into numbers or data. And then two, you generally need lots of it because machine learning models, they learn best through um, patterns. So if you just have a singular, singular data set or a singular data point, then that's probably not going to be enough. And this paper or project really focuses on natural language processing, uh, which is a subset of machine learning based on language. Yeah. And another term that I'll be using in this presentation is called emotional polarity. And basically emotional polarity, it's kind of what, what I showed in the presentation or the demonstration. It's whether this certain text is happy or sad. So you can see here, this is a data set. It's called SST2 and it's made by humans from Stanford NLP. And they basically labeled these movie reviews with um, whether this is a negative or a positive one. So you can see here, this contains no wit, only labored gags. It's definitely a negative review. So it's, it gives us zero and that's classified as negative. And then that loves its characters and communicates something rather beautiful about human nature is quite a positive review. So it gets a one and it's classified as positive. And finally, I think my goal is what is the, to find the most effective machine learning method of determining emotional polarity of text and yeah, so there's a couple steps we need to do before we can like directly apply machine learning. First, we have to find data sets. Now, this slide may look familiar because it was just the last slide, but uh, this is the SST2 data set. And the SST2 data set, you'll notice something really special about it is that it doesn't have like any formal grammar. Rather, it's like short blurbs of text and then they're classified. And these are all correct, by the way. These are all classified by humans. And then I also, because my goal is to, you know, use this on potentially classifying uh, people's messages, people sometimes write in really long sentences and stuff. So I also use the IMDB data set, which is also based on movie reviews, but this time it's a very long movie review, like about 300 to 600 words each. And you can see here, this is a negative review about the movie, I Am Curious Yellow. So now that we have our data sets, we need to do something called tokenization. So the idea of tokenization is that you wanna break up like a big block of words, like you just saw in the IMDB data set, that was about 300 to 600 words. And what you need to do is you need to break it up because machine learnings, they don't learn anything if you give them a huge block of words, because nothing repeats. You're probably never gonna see that exact sequence of 600 words again. But if you break them up into small characters, like down here you have natural language processing is broken into natural comma language comma processing. If you have that, then, you know, the model can identify, oh, the word natural appears three times, language appears twice, et cetera, et cetera. So 
it can learn through patterns. And that's the idea of machine learning, is you want your machine to learn through specific patterns in the data sets. OK, and then now that we have our um, tokenized text, uh, we need to do something called encoding. So our machine, it's not very good at reading like text data because our language, it's pretty inefficient. So what we want to do is convert it to numbers called vectors and store them. So I use this method called bag of words encoding. It's very simple, but it's also very effective. What it does, it's based on the frequency of each word. And the more times the word occurs means there's a higher number. So you can see right here, we initialize this um, encoding uh, array and you have cat, cute, dog, and small. And then you have three text samples. So you have small dog, and then it's 0011 because dog and small appear once. And then cute, cute cat, you have cat gets one, cute gets two, and then cute dog is 0110. And the idea with this is that, um, although this seems like a very uh, primitive way to store data, it's very strong because even like the small amount of data like this word occurs how many times is enough to almost accurately identify like 94 percent of text messages which i will get into a bit later and finally we get to our learning algorithms so learning algorithms they basically um they learn through patterns right and this is basically an algorithm that it splits the data on its features until it wants to have like a certain number of data and they want it to be like completely the same in each of these final sections and it can go until a specified maximum depth which i will cover in a bit and it's very strong for classification tasks and i have this very good example it's not necessarily related to natural language processing but let's say you wanted to classify an animal well the first question you would ask would be is it short or tall right you want to figure out is it a big or small animal if it's a short animal can it squeak? If it can squeak, then it might be a rat. And then let's say you, you ask tall. If it's tall and it has a long neck, then it might be a giraffe. So these, it's basically asking really good questions. And then if, depending on the answers to these questions, it's going to either the next question or a prediction. And that's basically the idea of a decision tree. It's just like a map for asking questions. <clears throat> but a problem with decision trees is that they're very simple. So this thing called overfitting can occur. And this occurs when too many splits are made. So you can see when there's too many questions are asked. So this becomes only accurate on the training data. And this happens to any type of model. And just as, as an example for that analogy I made with the um, animals, let's say your um, final model was supposed to predict like every animal, right? You're supposed to be able to tell any animal based on its features, but your training data was only on cats and dogs. So let's say it asked, what is the questions become like what is the color on your left front paw and that's that's a really bad question because you know some of them don't even, some of the animals don't even have paws and that's why uh you really don't want to do overfitting and another example is with linear regression models and they can also become kind of bad you can see here the uh, we have our blue train and it's it becomes all squiggly like normally you have a line of best fit to predict the next one but the red test you know it just the line doesn't know where to go anymore, so you can't predict on it. Yeah, so to fix that, I looked for a new solution, and this is my feed for a neural network. And basically what a feed for a neural network is, it the information flow is just one direction. So uh, it only goes through once, and it, it'll never go backwards until like back propagation. And it has two hidden layers, which basically means in between this input layer, and this output layer, there's two of these hidden layers. And each of these layers, they contain a certain amount of neurons. And these neurons, they all have this thing called an activation function. Activation function is, I will do a certain process on this data. And then if this data has like a specific value that's greater than one or zero, and it'll basically light up, kind of like the neurons in our brain. And then it'll pass the value down to the next neuron based on its connections. And that's basically a very simplified description of a neural network. But that's the basis of, this is one of the most advanced um, machine learning networks. And finally, uh, I'd like to talk about Distilbert. And what I did was I fine-tuned Distilbert. And Distilbert is a lighter version of Google's BERT model. And BERT is really strong for classification tasks because it basically, it's trained on a large data set. You know, Google probably spent like millions of dollars to train it. And, but also BERT is, 
it's good for classification of tasks because the first two letters of its acronym stands for bidirectional encoding. And this basically means that it gains like a better understanding over like classic machine learning models. And I do not have enough time to go into like detail about this. So if you are interested, you can go to the Hugging Face documentation for BERT and Distilbert. So now that we have our models, we wanna figure out what's the best way to, you know, identify how good this model is. So I use confusion matrices, which is in general, the best way to do this. And this displays the correctness of the model basically. So you can see here, there's accuracy, which is this TP plus TN over TP plus FP plus FN plus TN. And that's a lot of letters. But if you look on the right corner, it's very simple. So you have actual values and predicted values. Let's say it's positive. The actual value is positive, but and uh, your predicted value is positive, that's a true positive. If it's negative and negative, it's a true negative. And it's, it's basically very simple. Let's say I predicted the sentence, I'm having a very bad today. I said it was positive, but you know, it's actually negative. So that's a false positive. So accuracy is just the total correct over the total. And that's uh, generally the best way, but there's also a lot of different metrics, um, such as recall F1 score that I cannot go into detail but they're um, basically different ways to measure the correctness of the model, but generally accuracy is understood the best by us. I also, oh, sorry. I also use this thing called cross-validation, which is, you can see here is, um, you split it into five of these things called folds. You just divide the data set into five different uh, subsets. And then for each iteration, you wanna select one of them as a test data set, and then the rest you select as the trained data set. And what you'll notice is that um, every time we switch the test data set, so, and then we average the performance, and this just basically makes sure that the model is not getting extremely lucky on a singular test data set. And that's why, um, you know, it can help increase the robustness of our model. And I just want to go over the overall prediction process because that was maybe a lot to take in. So it's, it's quite simple, actually. You have our input. Let's say the input is lots and lots and lots of words. Tokenization will convert this to lots, comma, and, comma, lots, comma, and, comma, lots, comma, of, comma, words. And then encoding, it becomes 0, 3, 2, 0, 0, 1, 1. You know, 3 is lots, 2 is and, and then 1 and 1 are of words. And then the learning algorithm will convert this to 1. It'll say predict. This is 1. That's basically it. It's very simple. And so here are my results. Uh, you can see here the decision tree, uh, like I said, it's very, it's not very good because it overfits a lot. But the other two I talked about, the fee for all neural network and Distilbert, they actually scored pretty high. And in particular, I really like Distilbert because it, it's really easy to code. And secondly, it has a very high accuracy um, of 94%. Uh, one issue is that it takes 10 hours to set up and it's also predicts like uh, significantly slower than all other models. And it's also more memory intensive. So I use the Kaggle data, the Kaggle notebooks, which have 30 gigabytes of RAM. So that's pretty useful. But for lighter loads, you can definitely use the feed for neural network. It has two hours of runtime and 13 gigabytes of RAM. And but for what I want to do is I want to be able to use my model to predict like this on uh, put it into social networking platforms and then say this user has um, you know, out of his last 50 messages, 90% of them were negative. So I want to find these types of people using my machine learning model and, you know, direct them to support. And that's my goal. So if I were to do that, I would need to use uh, this model on large amounts of data. So it'd be better to have a more accurate model so I don't have to manually verify each of the predictions by myself. And that's why I chose Silver as my best. And if you guys want to try out the demonstration that I did at the start, you can go to tinyurl.com slash polygensdemo. But otherwise, that is my presentation. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, very interesting and I think very relevant uh, based on knowing what's happening as well within the, the youth mental health space. Um, do, do, do you feel like these models could handle you know, sarcasm, you know, mixed feelings, like how, how, did, how um, you know, how did, how did it, you think through those emotions? Yeah, so sarcasm is a pretty big, like, problem with machine learning models, because uh, generally it just, 
because it's generally understood through the tone of voice. So like, if you're saying this is so good, like if you wrote it down, it would probably look really good as yeah. a machine learning model. So I don't think it would handle sarcasm very well. But there's definitely ways you can like um, discuss sarcasm or use models to predict sarcasm, especially I saw this uh, fake news data set and you can apply this to machine learning. Basically, you can say that like if it's like extremely expressive of emotion, then it might be sarcasm because like, you know, you, re mm. you really emphasize the so when you're talking about this is so good sarcastically. Interesting. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, I mean that that might be the you know the six percent or something that I can't uh, that I can't predict. <laughs> yeah, um, I tried, very... like, tricky data sets or sorry, tricky questions. Like I tried like this is terrifically good, and I think the model is also pretty robust. At gotcha. Very cool. Um, do you feel like this is uh, something you'll continue doing research on? Yeah, definitely. So I'm looking into ways to implement Distilber into like trying to create it as more robust and efficient because currently, you know, it's kind of basic, my parameters right now. So I'm tuning those and then I'll also be looking into ways to implement it into large um, text databases. Gotcha. Um, and, you know, you mentioned um, the best, the, the most accurate model was also the most slow model. Um, is there one that you would kind of use if you were trying to, to, to do it more quickly? Yeah. So my, neural network it's it's really good at like um predicting kind of uh to a lesser extent accurately but it's also significantly faster than the distilbert model so i would say gotcha. if you if you have like a text base of 30 messages I'd definitely go for the uh the neural network because then you, because you don't need a you, because you can manually verify it so you don't want it to run like super slowly 